You are listening to Insight, the University of St. Andrews Student Physics Society's podcast. I'm your host and social convener, Samuel Lavery. Join us as we journey into the lives of St. Andrews academics, discovering their passions, inspirations, and motivations. Today we're interviewing Professor Moira Jardine at the University of St Andrews. Thanks for joining us. It's going to be a pleasure, I think. So could you tell us a bit about your positions here at the University within the School of Physics? So I came here in 1995 as a lecturer. That's a long time ago. And I'm a professor now and I have been for a couple of years. I can't remember exactly how long. Excellent, yeah. And what's your research or specialist area here? So I study stars that are like the sun, but younger. So the aim of my research is to understand how how our sun and how our solar system got to be the way that it is. So I do that by looking at systems that are younger than our own sun and seeing how they have evolved. That's actually um, a sort of acceptable way of saying that I work with magnetic fields because that usually puts people off if you say that. They get this Pavlov reaction. But the sun's magnetic field governs its uh, activity, so it's, it's high energy emission, which influences the planets around it. And also, um, it governs the rate at which the sun has spun down over time. So, actually, what I do is work with magnetic fields, but I try not to say that to people. Fantastic. Let's hope some more solar systems end up like this one. <laughs> I think we've got a good thing going here. Well, yeah, we just have to find them. So why do you feel that magnetic fields are so important and fascinating? I mean, is there more to it than that? Do you want to tell us a bit more? I just think they're really cool because they do all sorts of interesting stuff. You know, they have, they have unique behaviours which are fun, fun to study from a theoretical point of view. Um, so the theorist in me enjoys playing with equations, which might sound kind of sad to some people, but it's actually true. But also because it's one of the... It's one of the areas of study in physics where you can actually see the thing that you're studying. So you can look at images, for example, of the sun, and you can see examples of the thing you're trying to model. So that can be a bit scary because it means that your model has to be good enough to to match the observations. But it gives you some confidence that what you're doing has some meaning. So I, I I like to study problems that are sufficiently rooted in reality that you can actually observe. That actually means I should be studying something a bit more earthbound, really, but never mind. (laughs) Do you have one absolute favourite thing about magnetic fields? Yeah, there are no monopoles. (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) Div B is always zero, you ask any of my students about that. And what led you to your position here at St Andrews and studying magnetic fields? Oh... It's a long story. It's a bit like Brownian motion, actually. Um, I never intended to be here, and I never intended to be doing this. It's a series of accidents, actually. So when I was at school, I was best at Latin and English. Uh, And actually, they were my favourite subjects. I had wonderful teachers. And then there was this television programme a long, long time ago. It was called Einstein's Universe, and I was really blown away when I saw it. It was all about black holes and general relativity, and I thought, oh, this is so cool. I'll go to university and I'll do physics. So I came to university to do a physics degree. I actually came here. And the great thing about doing a degree here is you get this choice in your first year, so you can pick a subject just for fun. And I had a third subject I needed to pick, and it could have been astronomy or it could have been geology, and I was kind of torn between the two, and I thought, I'll take astronomy. I discovered I really enjoyed it. So I changed my degree from physics to astronomy, and uh, that was me set, set on my path to do astronomy. And then in my third year, one of my lecturers suggested to me I go on a summer course, in a summer internship at the Royal Greenwich Observatory, which was down in Sussex at that time. And so I went down there. I, the, the, the project I, I was given was... Um, was not what inspired me. Actually, what I really enjoyed was the people I met, because they were so enthusiastic. 
you know, they, they would work all day and it was a big, big open plan offices and you'd constantly hear people shouting across from one room to another, have you tried doing this or have you seen this wonderful data set or, oh wow, look what I've got here. And they were so keen and then they'd all go out to the pub for a drink and they'd grab a bite to eat and they'd be chatting away in the pub and then they'd all go back to work, you know, and they'd be in there till midnight. And I looked at these people and I thought, I want to do that. I want to do a job where... I like it so much that I want to go back in after dinner instead of you know being somebody that gets up on a Monday morning and thinks, oh, I've got to go to work today. So I thought, right, I'm, I'm going to do a PhD. So I came back to St Andrews and uh, applied for PhD places. And uh, I had had, I'd had lots of lecture courses that I really enjoyed, but I'd had one on masers, interstellar masers. And I thought this was really so interesting and what you could learn about star formation from, from these. So I went to all my interviews and I said I wanted to work on masers. And they all just kind of smiled, you know, politely when I said this. But at the end of each interview, I asked the person interviewed me what they were looking for. Because I thought, you know, I'm, it's a two-week process, an interview. I would like to find out if I've got what it is they're looking for. And uh, I was really crushed when quite a few of them said, well, you know, we're really looking somebody, looking for somebody who has got an excellent physics background and you know, excellent mathematical skills. In fact, we'd really prefer it if you'd had a maths degree. And I was very, you know, I was very young and I was very inexperienced. I didn't realise that this was just an interviewing tactic. They just wanted to put me on the back foot, uh, you know, and see what I came back to them with. But I was just totally crushed by this and I came away thinking oh, I'm not good enough to do a PhD, I'll never get to do a PhD because I don't have a maths degree. And, uh, and, and then my, you know, the inner mule came out and I thought, stuff that, I'm going to do a PhD in maths. Now. That'll show them. <laughs> so I interviewed for a maths PhD in the maths department here and it was Eric Priest who interviewed me. Eric was absolutely wonderful. He had a totally different approach to interviewing. He didn't put people down. Uh, he, was, he was very supportive, and uh, I said to him, you know, I haven't got a maths degree. I, I, really, I don't really feel that I'm up to this. And he pushed his chair back, and he laughed, and he said, oh, don't be so silly. He said, you're intelligent, and you're motivated. If there's anything you don't know, you can always learn. <laughs> he said, well, we can help you. You can go to courses. It's not a big deal. And it was so refreshing to get a different attitude. Um, so I thought, right, I can do this. So I changed to maths, and I did a, a maths PhD. And that's what got me into magnetic fields, because it was the, the solar physics group I was working with. So I've, I've been all around the houses with different things that uh, I've done. And after my PhD, I went back into astronomy again. So it's a, it's a catalogue of um, changes of direction. <laughs> Excellent. A series of very fortunate events, then. <laughs> well, I would like to think so. So if you weren't working in astrophysics, what is it that you would be doing? Latin? English? Geology? Oh, oh, oh that's, a, that's a good question. I would love to do archaeology, you know. I, I, I really would enjoy that. I go to Greece every year uh, on holiday. Go back to the same part of Greece. But I love going around the old ruins. Um, my family has eventually decided that I'm not allowed to look at any more Tholos tombs seen quite enough. I think I would do archaeology, actually. Yeah. Cool. Maybe when I retire. What was a physics concept that you struggled with as a student? Or maths? Or astrophysics? Oh, physics concept. The thing that I found hardest to understand, actually, was electronics. And I think I just never quite got my head around it. I was certainly, I was never any good at labs. I was always the student standing next to the smoking piece of equipment. Um, so labs were definitely um, where I nearly came a cropper a few times. What are the concepts that I really struggled with? I, there, there's, there's actually very many, and even, you know, probably hard for students to realise, but, you know, even their lecturers still have many things that they don't, they don't yet feel comfortable with. Um, or don't feel they've really got their heads around. And I, and I still find that even in my own area of research where you kind of feel, I really ought to know stuff, there'll, there'll be things that I'll look at and I'll think, actually, 
you know, that's more difficult than I thought. It's actually more complicated than I thought. So that's not a very good answer to your question because there are actually very many things. I think it's a fantastic answer. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I know nothing, nothing. So what's something that's happened in your work that's made you think, disaster? And how did you overcome that? Oh, right, okay. Um, so a PhD is meant to be about three years, roughly. It's a bit longer now. Now you have more like four, but when I was doing my PhD, you had three years of money. And I, was work I worked on a process called magnetic reconnection, which is the mechanism by which magnetic fields change their topology and release energy in the process. Um, and so I was working with this model of uh, two magnetized fluids colliding and looking at what happened in that collision. And so I'd, I'd done a little bit of analysis and, and I thought it was okay, but my supervisor very sensibly said to me, just before you publish that, you should integrate around the volume and check that you've conserved energy. And I thought, yeah, that's fine, I can do that. So I integrated around the volume, got a whole load of terms, and would you believe it, they didn't cancel out. It didn't conserve energy. And the words that came to mind, I can actually say to you because now we're being recorded. And, uh, but you can imagine, <laughs> you can imagine how I felt. And I thought, well, okay, I'm sure I've just dropped a minus sign because we all know that minus signs are the work of the devil. And I'm sure that if I just look through it, it'll come right. So I looked through it, and I looked through it again, and I kept looking, and I kept integrating, and I found mistakes here and there, could not get it to conserve energy. And it took me six months. Now, over a three-year PhD, six months is a long time. You know, after three months, I was really anxious, as was my supervisor. After six months, I was desperate because I had written off six... If I was going to abandon it, I'd written off six months, which I couldn't afford to lose. And I'm really, I'm really a stubborn person, and I was not prepared to let it go, but I knew that after six months, I really should let it go. And then, I can't even remember how it happened. Out of the blue, I had, I had a moment of revelation, and I realised that I'd made a really stupid assumption. Um... So I, I, had, I had shocks in my flow, and I was applying the shock relations in exactly the same way everywhere along the shock. So I was assuming that the shock relations were the same everywhere along the shock. But in fact, the strength of my shock was a function of position. So I had, to, I had an extra function of position that I hadn't accounted for. And when I realized this, my shocks were curved, then maybe that's an easy way to explain it, they weren't straight. When I realized that, and I put this extra function in, it all fell out. Everything cancelled. It's that wonderful thing. You've got an equation that goes across three lines and you go through and everything cancelled out and it was wonderful. And I was so relieved after six months of, you know, real stress that it actually all worked out. But it was, yeah, that was a very dark six months. <laughs> so I always say to students, if it's not working, you know, um, Go away and spend six months on uh, it. Yeah, don't panic for one thing. Um, but yeah, cut it off after six months. <laughs> Eureka. <laughs> Eureka. <laughs> so, what is your favourite astronomical object? My favourite astronomical object has to be the sun. It has to be, you know, it's the one star that we can see. Although I left solar physics and went into astronomy to look at all the other stars. The sun is, is close enough that you can observe in, in absolutely exquisite detail you know, all, the, all the processes that I'm studying in other stars. It's really challenging um, because the, there's so much data and the data is of such high quality. But and it's just beautiful as well. So I have a paperweight, um, which my husband gave me as a wedding anniversary present, I think. It's a 3D model of the sun's magnetic field. It's etched in glass, and it is absolutely beautiful. And it's, 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 this is what I do for other stars, is do these models. And it's, it's a thing of beauty, as well as being scientifically useful. Indeed. What a model, as well. Yeah, <laughs> and you can throw it at people. <laughs> in moments of, you know, extreme stress. Of course. 
What is the most beautiful or inspiring night sky that you witnessed? Where was it? The most beautiful night sky, I think, is actually the southern hemisphere. My husband is from New Zealand, his family uh, have an orchard, so we used to go down there and stay on the orchard. Uh, so the, the orchard is built on a peninsula that sticks out into a mud flat, and across the mud flat there are mountains that get snow on them in the, in the winter. So it's an absolutely idyllic spot, but it's also quite dark, it's quite a long way from anywhere else. So I was staying in one of the, um, the cottages on the orchard, just right down by the water, and it was you know, it's a very basic cottage, so there was no indoor loo. So I got up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, I need to go to the loo. So I tottered outside in my pyjamas, and I was halfway, and outside, a dunny it's called, so I was halfway to the dunny, and I suddenly stopped and I looked up and I thought, I thought it was clear. Why can I see clouds? It's meant to be clear. And it took me a second or two looking up to realise that what was looking up were the Magellanic clouds. It wasn't earthbound clouds at all. And you could see the whole structure of the Milky Way. You could really see the plane of the galaxy, and it looked like the plane of the galaxy. And you could see these satellite galaxies. And it was absolutely astounding. I had never seen the Magellanic Clouds. I would never really seen the plane of the galaxy before. And so I stood there on my way to the loo, uh, <laughs> looking up, and it was really striking. So the southern sky is really beautiful. I, have to, I say that as a northern hemisphere person, but it's actually true. Wow, that sounds amazing. I want to go. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend the outside loo, but, you know, apart okay. from that. Yeah. Yeah. So if you had the chance to ask your favourite physicist of all time one question, who <laughs> would it be and what would you ask? I suppose the easy answer is, is to think of a, a contemporary famous physicist, and Feynman would have been my obvious choice, not only because, not only because of his wonderful science, but he was such an inspirational teacher. You know, when you see the videos of him teaching or read his books, um, he, he, was, he was somebody who inspired a lot of other people to do science. However, we know a lot about Feynman because, you know, he, he lived in an age when, when there was television. So if I had to pick a famous physicist that I could go back and speak to, I would actually pick one of the ancients, about whom we know very much less. So I would pick Archimedes. You think of all the, all the wonderful things that Archimedes did, the mathematics, the Archimedean spiral, water screws, you know, which are still in use today. And then there's the, the whole Eureka thing. You know, I think I would like to ask Archimedes, did he really leap into the bath and leap out again? So, yeah, I would like to see if we could put that to rest, that question. It sounds quite fake, because if you jump in the shower, you're not getting out for half an hour if it's a <laughs> nice, toasty shower. So what's the most likely place for life within the solar system. We're excluding Earth. Ooh, likely. Is it a Jupiter moon, maybe? The moons, the moons are the most likely places. I mean, well, we'll, we'll find out a lot more about Mars quite soon. Um, you know, what, was, what its past history might have been. I would have said the moons are a much better source of hope. I think, I think we'll be surprised at how common simple life is. I think there'll be lots of places where there will be evidence, if not of the present day, um, of past simple forms of life. Um, so, you know, we'll find the odd physics student there, but um, <laughs> <laughs> more, more, um, more advanced forms of life I think will be quite a challenge. So would you join the first Mars colony? Actually, the answer is no. I've had this conversation with my husband because he would love to go to Mars. I think he would sell his soul and all his children to go to Mars. Um, I wouldn't, um, just because I would miss them. Uh, so unless I could take all my kids with me, uh, I wouldn't actually. I can, I can understand the excitement of wanting to do it, but I'm actually quite a home bird, and I wouldn't want to be that far away from home. He can go in his own. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could take your family, you would go, though? If Is I that, could take my family... Would that tempt you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd have to take the potatoes as well, though, you know, so having watched the film, I know that you need potatoes. So, yeah. so if you're going to Mars, potatoes and your family. <laughs> A good combo. <laughs>
What would you say is the most eccentric habit that you or a colleague has? Oh, oh, there are probably too many to mention eccentric habits. You, you should never ask a person about their own eccentric habits because I don't think any of them are eccentric. Um, <laughs> eccentric habits. I sing in the shower. Um, that's that's fairly really, normal. <laughs> that's fairly normal. Um, I enjoy my work. That's probably actually quite unusual. I don't know. I, I don't actually know. And I refuse to dob in any of my colleagues whose eccentric habits I know, um, know and love. And, and yes, we, we won't discuss their eccentric habits. <laughs> That's quite all right. So physicists, they're odd people. They enjoy their work. That's what we'll put down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> As an astronomer and astrophysicist, you've obviously probably taken a long time observing the skies. And to do that, you need the right kit. So what is the perfect hot chocolate? Ah, well, you know, I've, I've seen that film, what's the one with Santa Claus, where he, he meets the elves at the North Pole and the chief elf explains to him about the perfect hot chocolate, the not too hot, not too sweet uh, hot chocolate. My perfect hot chocolate actually is the one that you have by the ski slopes. So you're sitting out in the sunshine in the deck chair and everybody else is working hard around you. And you've been left behind because you're not a very good skier. But you have the best hot chocolate and it's got rum in it as well, which I, I think you know, really finishes it off. But it's not sweet um, and it's really, really thick. But it has to be drunk in the snow and in the sunshine with your feet up on something. That does sound glorious. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? <laughs> What's one thing that you wish you had learned or had done by now? I wish I had learned to play the piano. This is my, um, this is my retirement project. I'm, I'm actually not very musical, I'm completely tone deaf. But I reckon with a piano it doesn't matter because you don't have to tune it. Um, so I reckon it's an instrument that I could play without too much disaster. Uh, and both my daughters play the piano so I saw them learning, and I desperately wanted to learn as well, but uh, I never made the time. So when I retire, I'm going to learn to play the piano, and then I'm going to play duets with them, which will be nice. Oh, how lovely. <laughs> well, it, it may not be lovely. <laughs> Nonsense. We look forward to seeing you on stage. <laughs> oh, no. So what is your favourite hobby? Actually, I guess it would be walking. I mean, I, I also ski, but that's not something you can do all year round. Um, in the summer, I like snorkelling, but only in very warm water. So I, I, don't, I don't go snorkelling here. It's far too cold. Uh, I've been threatened with a wetsuit, but it really is still too cold. So I think as a hobby that you can do all year round, I enjoy walking. I like being outside in almost any weather, actually. Yeah, hill walking. Oh, nice. If you wait long enough, Gotten food you can do any sort of weather. Like <laughs> yes, <that>. yes. <laughs> so do you have a favourite sport or team or player? I'm sorry to say the answer is no. I don't watch sport at all, I'm sorry. It's just I I don't have the gene, I don't think. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's quite all right. We'll just perpetuate that physicist stereotype. Oh, dear. So might seem a bit far away, but Christmas is actually coming up. Oh, it's closer than you think. <laughs> Always. Um, so what are Christmas traditions that you have? We have lots of Christmas traditions, but the, the main one that I enjoy doing is, and it goes from when my, my kids were very little, so we have an open fire at home. So when the kids were little, and I still do it, we have to, and you know, my oldest is 25 now, we, we still have to pretend that Santa is going to come down the chimney. What do you mean, pretend? Well, exactly, yes, yes. We, 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 we know that Santa comes down the chimney. And we know what Santa likes to drink, so it's a very nice malt. And every year we have a different malt that we leave out for him. Uh, and we know that the reindeer likes carrots with still the green bits on the end, so that's all left out, and sometimes shortbread as well. But the main thing is that Santa has to write a letter when he arrives. So first of all, you have to, once everybody else is in bed, you have to go down and you have to pull the grate out of the fire 
and spread lots of um, ash around and then you have to get somebody's wellies and make footprints in the ash so you can see that Santa came down the chimney and walked through the ash and then you have to drink the whiskey and eat the shortbread and make a munch at some of the carrots and then you have to write a letter because Santa has been left a letter by everybody else. I'm very good at putting letters up the chimney, you see, it's a real art that you don't burn your hand but you get the letter to, to go up. And Santa then has to write a letter to reply to everything that's been sent to him. Now Santa by this time has had a wee dram or two uh, and his writing is incredibly flowery and it's always in different colours so every word is in a different colour and he writes a letter back to everyone else about what he's been doing and how his year went and uh, what his hopes and aspirations are and then his letter gets left. <laughs> so when everybody gets up in the morning there are stockings and there's Santa's footprints and there's a, a letter from Santa. And this still happens today. <laughs> that was a truly lovely tradition. I love that. Wow. <laughs> You'd love it less when you have to clean up all the soot down out of the chimney, but apart from that... <laughs> what is the most amusing Christmas meal or party that you've been to? The most amusing Christmas meal um, was one of my own. So I'm not a cook. You know, I'm functional. Any fool can follow a recipe. But I'm not really a cook. My husband does all the cooking. But he, for 20 years, he went away every Christmas to observe. He observed the same star every year, and it could only be observed in the Southern Hemisphere. It's a Southern Hemisphere object. So uh, he went to Australia every single Christmas, or every second Christmas. So I was always left to cook Christmas lunch. However, I, I took a very pragmatic attitude to this, and I reckoned that... Marks and Spencer's stuffed chickens were really just as good. So I got Marks and Spencer's stuffed chickens and uh, I could do roasted vegetables okay. But it would come, you know, it would come midday or so. We were all sat down to Christmas lunch. There's 10 of us or 11 of us because I've got quite a big family. And uh, the phone would ring and this would be Andrew from the telescopes. Of course, it was night time there. So he'd be phoning up to say Happy Christmas. Yeah, yeah. And it was always in the middle of cooking, so I always had, you know, three pots on the stove and, and roasted vegetables in the oven and ten people waiting for lunch, and the phone would ring. And I remember standing on the phone and, and shouting down the phone at him, Andrew, Andrew, I don't know how to make gravy, you're going to have to tell me how to make gravy. <laughs> at which point, somebody came through from the dining room and said, oh, for heaven's sake, don't worry about the gravy, you know. <laughs> With the subtext, it's all burned anyway. <laughs> I've not been allowed to forget this, that Andrew had to phone me up from the telescope to tell me how to make gravy. Yeah. A crucial element of any Christmas meal, however. <laughs> so what is the worst present that you've ever received? We've seen the lovely paperweight, but what's the worst thing you've the ever got? The worst present? Hmm. That would have to be the sort of present that you're given but you don't actually want to use. So it's like, you know, somebody gives you, oh, I don't know, a vacuum cleaner or something, you know, the sort of an iron, the sort of thing that is, you know, really quite functional, but you don't want to use or don't know how to use. I don't know, can we get anything, actually? I did get one wedding present that I, you know, you tear open wedding presents in the excitement, and then the next day you look at the pile of things and you think, actually, I have no idea who gave me that thing. And that means you can't write to thank them, which is very embarrassing. Um, so I think that has to be the worst wedding present, just because I still, to this day, 30 years later, feel a sense of guilt that there was one person I never wrote to to thank them for the wedding present. <laughs> they probably hate me now. <laughs> I'm sure they do. <laughs> so now we want to move on to some quicker questions. Okay. Um, so, you know, you can breeze for these hopefully quite easily. What's your favourite type of food? I eat almost anything. My favourite type of food is food that's cooked by someone else other than myself. I like Cambodian food. And I, I've got a Cambodian recipe. I don't cook it myself, I should point out. Um, but I like Cambodian food. But almost anything. The only thing I, I don't particularly like is sushi. Well, that was the next question. Most Do hated I like sushi? Food. Most hated <laughs> sushi. Yeah, not that, not so much hated. It's just not my favourite, um, and I'm allergic to mussels, which I know is not sushi, but it's a form of seafood. That uh, yeah, sushi most hated food. Yeah, mm. brown bread or white bread. Brown, absolutely. Strong choice. 
Tomato ketchup or HP sauce? Ketchup, which has got another name in news all you realise, but I can't say that either because it's not polite. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your favourite movie or TV genre? Oh, I, I really have very Catholic tastes. Um, I don't like sad films, but almost almost anything else. I actually, I really quite like mindless action films um, or something funny, uh, comedies. I watch a lot of romantic comedies with my daughters um, because they're the only ones who put up with it. <laughs> I I am actually I have I have very broad tastes. Nice. What's your favourite non-academic book? Uh, well, the most recent one, the most recent one that I really enjoyed was A Man Called Ovi. I don't know if you've read it. It's Frederick Beckman. And Ovi is a lovely character. You start off at the start of the book, he's a grumpy old man. And the first few pages you're thinking, oh, you know, he's a terrible character. And as the book goes on, you fall in love with him because he really is he's lovely. And when you find out his history, you realise why he is the way he is. And he's, he's actually terribly kind and a nice person. And by the same author, uh, there's another book called My Grandmother Sends Her Regards and Apologises. And it's, it's the story of a little girl whose grandmother has died and the grandmother has left her a series of letters to be delivered to, to lots of different people. And the little girl has to deliver these letters. And in delivering the letters to all the people her grandmother knew, she learns about who her grandmother was, and she learns about the history of her own family. And it's a really, it's a lovely story. So those those two are my most, yeah, they're, they're the ones that I've enjoyed most. Those do sound lovely. What is your favourite music genre and favourite song? <laughs> is this another like broad tastes category? No, no, well, no, it isn't actually. Um... I suppose historically I actually like Motown, but the reason I'm laughing is that if you judge what is your favourite song, it would be the thing that you find yourself singing most often. Now, my, any of my family will tell you that I, there is a song that I sing particularly when we were on holiday. It's Swimming by, um, oh, what's the, what's the group that sings it? Breathe, I'll breathe. And then I go, swimming, I wish I was swimming. And there's this, a soundtrack that sounds like somebody blowing bubbles underwater. And it's a song about uh, somebody who swims in all sorts of different places and the sheer pleasure of, you know, jumping into rivers and swimming underwater. And I sing this endlessly in the car when we're holiday. And as soon as I open my mouth and start to sing swimming, everybody shouts at me, oh, shut up, stop singing that. <laughs> so I think that has to be my favourite song. But I'm not going to sing it for you. <laughs> <laughs> what a pity. <laughs> I know you're, you're gutted, aren't I'll, you? <laughs> I'll wait till you can play it on the piano. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where to hold on, when to let go. Swing out, give out a yell. You'll never hit bottom. You'll never grow tired. This wonder, you're under water. I wish I was. I wish I was swimming I wish I was I wish I wish I wish I was swimming I wish I was swimming I wish I was swimming I wish I was I wish I wish I wish I was How often do you go out observing? Never. Never? You mean actually with a telescope? With or without? The only time I go out and look at the night sky by choice is when we're in holiday in Greece and it's actually warm enough to go and stand outside. So um, I, I do go and lie by the pool at night, I'll go and swim in the pool at night and lie and look up and look at the northern sky but from a lower latitude so the constellations look slightly different. You can see Scorpio which you can't see from here. Um, so you know in July in Greece, beside a swimming pool, late at night, I do go observing from the horizontal and a swimming pool. Excellent. But not so, for any scientific reason. <laughs> seems a pretty ideal situation, to be honest. So, to finish us up, could you tell us the most important thing that looking up at the skies and the stars can teach us? 
I think the most important thing they can teach us, which is the one fundamental overriding principle of physics. <laughs> I can't even say it with a straight face. <laughs> but the conservation of angular momentum. Because you look up at the night sky and what do you see? I mean, from your, from your frame of reference, you see everything rotating around you. And I think that's a great illustration of that fundamental principle. And if you ask anybody who's ever had any of my lecture courses, they'll tell you that my two most favourite things in life are magnetic fields and angular momentum. So I think that's what you learn by looking up at the night sky. <laughs> that was very tongue-in-cheek, wasn't it? <laughs> no, that's a great answer. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's been a pleasure. You've been listening to Insight, the University of St Andrews Student Physics Society podcast. I was your host, Samuel Avery. Our thanks to the wonderful academics of St Andrews. And join us in the future as we learn more of the people making our education. This podcast was produced by myself and our publicity officer, Connor McBride. To find out more about the Physics Society and what we do, please find us on Facebook or Google St Andrews Physics Society for our website. Goodbye.